Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis, and welcome to Books and Looks. Yes, it's my weekly podcast where I talk about a book that I've read, interview the author, and then have a take a look at something I personally have been looking at. And I appreciate everybody who's been following me. I hope you've enjoyed the last few weeks. We've had some absolutely wonderful uh, reviews on and books and interviews. I hope you're really, really following along and reading the reviews on uh, viewsonbooks.com, listening to the interviews, because I'm telling you, they're great books here. And today's a special, that's right, today's a special podcast because it's right around Thanksgiving. And I'm going to begin with a look today because that leads into this entire discussion. Today, we're going to be talking about my Baker's Dozen Christmas gift list. That's right. Now, why are we looking at that? Because I am looking at books of the year. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been getting bombarded by notices that, well, the National Book Award has come out. And of course, some author who I never heard of wrote a book I never would read and won an award that I don't really care about. Okay. But I got also the uh, surveys from uh, Goodreads, the most, the best books of the year. Out of around 120 books, I think I've seen or read seven of those. Okay, that's a popularity contest. They're going to start coming out with the best books on New York Times, on Washington Post, on the LA Times, on the Wall Street Journal. Have you seen these lists? I'm getting bombarded by best book lists. The thing that I love about these best book lists is the person who compiles them didn't read the books. They didn't read all those books. No. They have a group there. They read it. Somebody says this. Somebody does that. You can't read all the books that are out there. So, you know, it's very subjective because as I've told you folks in the past, I'm now at something like 1,250 books I have received for review. 1,250 books. And that's me. Imagine what the big boys get. You cannot read every book out there. Nope. And so I'm not here to talk about the highbrow, the literary intelligentsia. No, no. I'm here to talk about books that are good books, that are readable books that you and I want to read, which either tell us a great story, teach us something, or we learn a whole heck of a lot. And so I decided that this year I was going to create not the best of the year. No, no, no. I'm creating my Baker's Dozen Christmas gifts list. That's right. That is a hard word for me to say. You know that, friends? Baker's Dozen Christmas gift list. I have to say it very slowly. That's right. 13 books that you should be looking at to buy for your loved ones or your friends, relatives, husbands, spouses, partners, kids, whatever. These are books you should be getting because I think they're some of the best that I have read. Certainly, they're not all of them out there. And there are books that I have read and reviewed and discussed with authors who are not going to make this list. But every book that is on this list We have got an author interview, all are on the podcast, on Apple Podcasts. Many of them are now on the YouTube also. We also have them all reviewed on uh, viewsonbooks.com. So anyway, that's what I've been looking at. Book lists, end of the year book lists. I don't care. I'm not talking about the best. I'm talking about your baker's dozen Christmas gift list. And so where does one begin? And I'm not going to start with, say, here's number one and here's number 13, and they're rated in order. No, I just pick books, put them in a category, and that's the way we go. So don't get any impression if it's first or last, it's the worst or the best. No, no, they're all 13 great books. And I want to start out, if you are a fan of espionage books, and many of you are, Many, many people love espionage books. I love espionage books. Le Carre, Eric Ambler, they're just a few. Then the book for you that you want to get for your friends or loved ones, The Bucharest Legacy, Rise of the Oligarchs by William Maas. Now, this is a second book in his series that begins back in 1989 and with the fall of the Ceausescu regime in Romania. Now, yes, I know my wife's Romanian. So I have, obviously, I know a little more than many people, but Maz writes a book that is so interesting and easy to follow. And the espionage that goes on in this one, where he's now going back, the, the protagonist in this book is going back to, you know, back to Romania and now trying to find out what's going on over there, what's happening, where, you know, no, everything's like the Wild West out there. People are making deals. They're, they're bad people. We have Ceausescu's son, Niku, who, you know, not the nicest of all people. 
And so this is a spectacular book about espionage. It is an old-time thriller. And you know what? This book has won and has been nominated for so many book awards. It is out of this world. Now, I tell you, I don't pay a lot of attention to book awards. But if you're looking about specific books and specific categories, most of those people who vote on those have read many, many, many of those books. Moz's book is spectacular. It is a wonderful look at that. 1989, before the technology that you and I had, there's before cell phones and before internet, you know, goes back and digs into things. We find the fact that they have miles and miles of secret police recordings underneath buildings. I mean, the stuff that he got into, and this, friends, this is all legit. This is all legit. I've talked to, to William. He and I regularly correspond. And I'm going to tell you what, he has his finger in the pulse of what's going on over there and what did go on. So if you want a really good espionage book, seat of the pants book, you want to go with the Bucharest Legacy, Rise of the Oligarchs by William Maz, M-A-Z. I'm going to go now switch gears and move into nonfiction. I got two books in nonfiction I think you're going to really enjoy. Now, when I say nonfiction, people go, mm. Well, it's a little heavy for me. No, it's not. These are great reads. These are fun reads. These are good reads you're going to get. And the first one, which we just (laughs) did not too long ago, is Charlie Chaplin versus America by Scott Iman. Now, this is the newest book by the premier biographer on the golden age of Hollywood. I love Scott Iman's books. Okay, I've read his books on on John Wayne, on Cary Grant, on uh, Cecil B. DeMille on all these old timers. And this is his newest one. And what makes this interesting, folks, is a lot of people do not remember Charlie Chaplin. They see him as the little tramp, but there was a lot after Chaplin and a lot that was considered controversial. But here, he deals specifically with around three or four movies. Oh, yes, you get background on Chaplin's uh, uh, history and everything, but it really focuses on why the United States was after this man. Why, when he boarded a boat, to go to England to promote his movie Limelight, two days into the boat ride, he gets told he's basically deported. Now, he's not a U.S. citizen, but he'd even checked and they said, no, you're, you're free to come back. No troubles. And then he gets out there and they find out that, well, the Secretary of State didn't want him to come back. He may have some allegiances that they don't like. You know, they, they looked at him and they, he was smeared by gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, Ed Sullivan. People didn't like him. Some didn't like him because he made a lot of money and did not want to become a citizen. Now, he paid taxes. It's not like he didn't pay taxes. He just wasn't a citizen. He didn't believe in citizenship anywhere, okay? That's the thing. He was just, he felt he was a citizen of the world. And we're going to find out all about that. You know, there is so much. You read about his, his friendships, which lasted long, long times, as well as the infamous child paternity trial, in which his blood test proved he was not the father of this child, and lo and behold, <laughs> the judge didn't care. The heck with it. The heck with Even though we had a deal, the heck with it. We're going to make you, the, we're going to declare you the father, and you're going to have to pay child support for 18 years to someone who is not his child. They were after him. They first, they thought he was anti-fascist. Then they thought it was anti-communist. Then they thought he was pro-communist. Then he was pro-fascist. You name it. If they could come up with an idea, they would try to pin it on Charlie Chaplin. And it's all in Charlie Chaplin versus America by Scott Iman. And a little note: the day that the day that we recorded and we, we uh, published his interview that very night, Scott was on uh, Turner Classic Movie talking about the movies that we had discussed right here in the podcast, which is pretty darn neat. My next nonfiction book is called Little Poison. Little Poison by John DeCant. Now, this is a book. Not <laughs> poison is not murder or anything like that else. It is the nickname of a golfer. That's right. It's about a gentleman named Paul Runyon. And I did this interview way back in the spring because it all tied in with the PGA Championship. And Runyon is a, is a marvelous story. See, it's not just about golf, which is fascinating to me, even though I don't play golf anymore, but it's also his life story, which is fascinating. He grew up in Arkansas, a small child, 5'2", 5'3", weighed 110 pounds and was fascinated by the game of golf. All he did was practice, practice, practice when he had time. He worked on the golf course. Mm -hmm. 
because the farm he lived on was right across the street from a golf course and he practiced. He would hit anywhere from 800 to 1,000 shots every day, day in, day out. He knew he wasn't the size of the big boys, the big professional golfers. He knew they were all big, strapping people, 5'10", 6 feet, 6'1". Back then, that was pretty big. He was 5'2", around 110 pounds. There's a saying in golf, you drive for show and you putt for dough. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, little poison, Paul Runyon certainly did that because he perfected the short game, the short game of golf around the green, 80, 100 yards into the green and on the green itself. He was an expert. And you get to learn a little bit about how his regimen in life was. Now, that's what got my wife. My wife loved this. Magda loved this book because of this, because we talk, or he, the author writes about the regimen that this gentleman had. He didn't believe in eating pork because he says pork is in my stomach, weighs heavily on me. I don't drink alcohol. Then maybe a, uh, maybe one glass of uh, wine. That's it. Because he thought he got made him sluggish. You see, he had all these things. He got early to bed. He wasn't a carouser. Married to his wife for 40 years. Didn't do any of that stuff. And was just a solid guy. He loved to play golf. And who beat the big guys at the game. Beat the Paul Sarah beat the Sam Sneeds, beat them all. He could beat them all. Yeah, the whole thing culminated in a PGA championship. Back then, it was not as we are used to, rounds of, of you know, 18 holes. Back then, it was what they call match play. He beat Sam Sneed so bad, he beat him by what's called eight and seven. There were seven holes left to play. He led Sneed by eight holes. Yeah, it was impossible to come back. He demoralized the man. Ah, oh, you'll read about his what he did, though. His regimen that time was spectacular, including bathing. <laughs> that comes into the whole thing. So this is a fun book, uh, a little bit about what golf used to be before it became what's happening now in golf with the PGA and the Live Tour and the Saudis and everything else. This is what golf used to be. And, and regimen about a really interesting guy who knew he wasn't going to be one of the big hitters of the tour, but did what he could to still become one of the top names of the tour. And by the way, in his 90s, he was still coming to Augusta to play that uh, par three tournament before the uh, Masters. What a, what a life. Well, now, we're moving over towards fiction. And I've got to be honest with you. Every year, I seem to have like a quirky little book. Last year, my quirky book was called Oranges for Magellan. <laughs> that was a fun book. This year, the quirky title of the here goes to the Crow Valley Karaoke Championships. That's right. The Crow Valley Karaoke Championships by Allie Bryan. The Canadian author is a fun person to talk to. This is all about what goes on at a karaoke night championship up in Canada. But it's not so much about the singing, although there's some bits about that, but what the people go to. What's going on? I mean, people get dressed up in costumes to, to sing. I didn't realize that. They used to do that. But it's also about the people themselves, their lives. What's going on with their lives leading up to and during that championship? We have little kids running around. We even have a jailbreak, if you can believe that. A prison break is part of this, this story. It is some dark humor, but also some very interesting questions that she poses. She poses some fascinating questions about motherhood, about friendship. I'm going to tell you what, it all came together on one night, one night in Canada. That's right. The Crow Valley Karaoke Championships by Allie Bryant. I'm going to tell you what, wonderful writer. I have some of her other books. They're spectacular stuff, but I think you're going to really enjoy this. By the way, who cannot enjoy a book about karaoke? Yeah, really, it's a lot of fun. So for my first Fiction book, The Crow Valley Karaoke Championships by Allie Bryan. It's a winner. I might not win the karaoke, but this book gets the winner seal. Now, next, we're going to another fine book called The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club. The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club by Julia Bryan Thomas. Oh, I like Julia Bryan Thomas. Oh, yes. She and her husband, Will, are maybe the top husband-wife writing team out there right now. 
And this is a wonderful book set up in Radcliffe College, which is Cambridge, right next to Harvard. And it's set in the 1950s. Now, when you hear things like, you know, book clubs, reading clubs, library, this, boom, ba, boom, boom, you know what you're going to get, right? No, not with this. This is a fascinating look at the life of four first-year female students at Radcliffe. Now, Radcliffe, in case you weren't aware of it, was an all-girls college. This no longer exists, by the way. It's been bought out by Harvard, and so uh, it still exists in the sense that there's some buildings there, but it's not a separate university. But anyway, these four girls from very diverse backgrounds, and by that I mean one's from California, one's from a farm, one's from upstate New York, okay, one's from Ohio, or I, or I mean it's Chicago. They come together as sweet mates, and the one girl walks down the street, and she sees a bookstore and says they're going to have a uh, reading club. And she goes in, and she meets the owner, and can I bring my, my sweet mate? Sure. And here we go. And, you know, it's not about the books they are reading, although the books they are reading do tie into some of the things that are happening in the book. No doubt about that. Beautiful work by Julia to do that. But it's about the personal growth, development, and problems of these four girls. We learn so much about what life was like back in the 1950s for girls going to college. We learn so much about what can happen when one minute you're not being careful and how that will change your life forever. We also learn about jealousies. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of petty jealousy that goes on here. I was so impressed with this book. If there's a book, I'm telling you, if you belong to a book club, this is a book that the book club should read. Not that there's a book about a book club, but you should read this book. If you just like a well-written book, then this is the book you want to read. She's a wonderful author, and the Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club by Julia Bryan Thomas is one of my Baker's dozens for 2023. Now, my next two books discuss different parts of World War II. And I know a lot of you don't want to think about what happened back then, because there are a lot of bad things that happened. But these are two books which I think are just outstanding and teach us stories and tell us stories about things we might not have ever thought about. And the first one I want to recommend to you is called Under the Java Moon by Heather B. Moore. Under the Java Moon. You know, when you hear that title, you expect palm trees and you expect a love story. No, it's not. It is a spectacular, spectacular biographical novel of a World War II POW camp in the Dutch East Indies over in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. It is filled with biographical stories, quotes about what the actual POW people went through at the time, and it is an unknown part of the war. You know, there were over a thousand islands in Indonesia in the Dutch East Indies. Each of them had their own prison camps. It was out of this world. And what these poor people were, were herded into, you know, and what they had to put up with was typical what happened at other prison camps. But they segregated men and women. And at first, the Dutch thought, okay, so the Japanese have taken over. All will stay the same. No, they're herded in, and they're basically put in these, well, they're not camps. They're, 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 they put fences around houses, maybe a group of six or eight houses. And in each of those houses, they now had 100 to 120 people. There was no privacy. You couldn't own anything. You couldn't do anything. Your your dignity was taken from you. And that's true. That's true at any POW camp. But this is one that we never hear about. I never knew about the POW camps over there in Indonesia. Did you? Did you? I don't know. Maybe you know more than I do. But I talked to a gentleman from uh, that region, uh, from the Netherlands, and he had heard somewhat about this. But again, it's something that people don't talk about a lot. And this this book is an eye-opening biographical novel. It's almost a history, almost a history, but it is a novel. And the lady who is the lead character was a little girl in the book, Marie. And uh, I got to be honest with you. It is a wonderful, wonderful story. We learn a lot. There's no gore, okay? There's no blood, guts, gore, or anything like that. There's hardship, there's difficulty, and all those other things. But as I said, this is a little-known part of the war that we don't even know about. And some of the quotes that you read, including one gentleman who said, you know, we had all the best tailors, the best bakers, the best everything, were Japanese. 
And after the invasion, they were all our guards. They were all the people in charge. And he said, were we being spied on for all these years? And while it doesn't explain everything went on in the West Coast of America in the 1940s, you start to see people question, well, why, how did all of a sudden they became a nobody and now they're, you know, basically in charge of the camp or doing things to the lead guards? Mm -hmm. Gotta wonder, was there coordination and cooperation prior to that invasion? It's amazing. It's a great book. I'm going to tell you what, you you read it. It's an eye opener. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And then we move to the other end of this, which is the Glass Chateau, the Glass Chateau by Stephen P. Kiernan. Oh, my. From the very beginning, he asked the question, does victory mean peace? This is a wonderful book about healing. It's all about healing after the war. And it's the story of a French resistance fighter, not just your typical French resistance fighter, but an assassin. That's right. His job was to kill and not kill at long range. He was up close. It was, you know, a knife in the back. Garroting, whatever it was, it was a difficult, difficult thing this gentleman had to do. And by the end of the war, he was a broken man. He was a broken man. He didn't know what to do. He was ready to kill himself, to be honest with you. And then one day he was walking and he comes across a woman with a dog. And he couldn't believe that because the dog is, no one had dogs. The, the, the Germans had killed all the dogs. And the woman tells him, you have to go to this little town of Clovide. In there, you will find peace. And he goes to get his uh, shoes. He was going to go drown himself. When he turns around, neither she nor the dog are there. And, you know, that's one of the things we discussed with uh, author Stephen P. Kiernan, who turned this around and started asking me questions. Yeah, can you imagine? (laughs) But anyway, this is all about finding inner peace and healing. And this is inspired by the famed artist Marc Chagall. Now, Chagall didn't have the same situation, but Chagall became a master of stained glass windows. And it's that mastery, it's that that whole craft which gave Stephen the inspiration to write this book. And that this person finds peace while making stained glass. And there are around eight or nine people there. One person won't give his name. One person is always sarcastic and ugly, you know, and and so he's dealing with all these different people and how over the years they start to find peace by the gentle art of making stained glass, blowing glass, making glass, making church windows. This is a just a fantastic book, okay? Just a fantastic book. And Stephen Kernan gives it a serious, serious look at this topic at this discussion about finding peace and trying to find healing. And nowadays we got wars and things going on in the Middle East, we got stuff going on over in the Ukraine. You know, those people are going to eventually have to find peace. And will there be any victory in peace? I'm not so sure anybody wins when there's war. But anyway, a great book, The Glass Chateau by Stephen P. Kiernan. Now, let's lighten things up a little bit. It's Christmas time. That's right. And if you want the one book, the one and only book you should buy for the Christmas holiday season that deals with the Christmas and holiday season, Winter Lights. That's right. Just a few weeks ago, Winter Lights, we interviewed the author, Deborah Jenkins. What a nice woman. What a fine group of short stories. Yeah. The art of writing short stories, it it is an art. I couldn't do it. Okay. I don't know. I wouldn't have the patience. I don't have, the, I don't have the, the mind to think of all these different short stories and all the different characters. But she has 10 short stories. And the first eight deal with different types of individuals in different situations. Okay? Every story is inspiring. Every story is heartwarming. And it is wonderful. And what makes this even more wonderful is what Deborah has overcome. Because she began her life without a problem, without a disability, without a handicap. And she got an autoimmune disease. And next thing you know, she starts getting ear infections. And before you know that, she becomes profoundly deaf. That's right. She becomes deaf. And now it's when she starts writing. And she, as an insight, 
I think it inspired her. It inspired me, I'll tell you that much. She's a wonderful writer. These so, these stories, the first eight, are just so unique and individual. And then she ties everybody together in number nine and ten. And that's what's great. It's not just ten you know, unconnected stories. They all come back to something. They all come back to one big story where everybody is involved. And you're going to really really enjoy it like i said it's uh it is one of my favorite books uh that i've read this year and if you're looking for a quality quality winter holiday christmas book this this group of 10 short stories and it's not a long book 150 100 200 pages maybe this is a book for you i read it with my wife one morning every morning we read one story many times she ended up in tears okay because the stories are just so touching and so moving anyway Winter Lice by Deborah Jenkins. Now, let's move on to history. Now, I got two good history books for you, okay? Two really good history books for you. If you have never heard about the N4, you're not the only person. That's why Mark Piecing wrote his wonderful book, N4 Down. Now, this is about the Arctic exploration and as well as the quest for the Northwest Passage. This was back in like 1928. They're trying to find the magnetic North Pole. There is all sorts of stuff going on because we've got, oh, my, oh, my. The, <laughs> we've got Umberto Nobile, okay, who is a airship magnet from Italy. And he wants to, to go and find the North. He wants to find the North Pole, maybe find the Northwest Passage, who knows. And he's in a race with Roald Munson. That's right, famed explorer Roald Munson. He's involved in this. Well. These two have actually get together at one time and go up in one of the balloons, and they have to turn back. They never make it. After that, every man for themselves. And so Nobile builds the N4, and he's going to take this, this balloon, this blimp, up in the north, and he's going to go and find the uh, magnetic north. Because even the one, the one trip they did find, they went all the way over <laughs> from Europe to Alaska. Yeah. They got that far, but they never got to the North Pole. <laughs> so it was considered a failure. But we see the involvement of, of uh, Mussolini, because Mussolini was using this for publicity. And he, oh, he loved Nobile until Nobile crashes. That's right. There's an accident. What happened to the N4? How did it happen? What about those people after the accident who blew away into the air? What happened to them? Where did they land up? What happened to everybody? You know? It is really, really a edge of your seat thriller almost about what happened to this book, this, excuse me, this airship N4 Down. And uh, I'm telling you what, it, it was an eye opener. I never realized they were still doing that. You know, when we talk here in America, we talk about airships, we talk about the Goodrich Blimp, okay, the Snoopy One, and the Hindenburg. I never realized that the airship was big stuff over there in Europe. And of course, they're using everything with hydrogen, which is flammable. So they got to watch out for that stuff too. Yeah, they weren't using helium. They were all using hydrogen. And it was an uh, amazing way people were cruising. And, and they envisioned, you know, this could be the ways of the future. People are going to ride blimps, but not airplanes. And Nobile was, like I said, was one of the leading lights in this. And you were going to read all about what happened, how it happened, and then the strange death of Roll Munson. Yeah, that, that's part of this, too. So very good book. N4 Down by Mark PC. I think you're going to really, really like that book. And if you want to come back to America, then I suggest you look at, uh, again, another fine book my, by my friend Chris Wimmer. The book is The Summer of 1876. Now, Chris is, uh, you know, he's spectacular. Okay, he's got three podcasts going on, including Legend of the Old West, including Infamous America. And then he finds time to write this book. And educate us all about the summer of 1876, the bi or just the centennial year. That's right, not bicentennial, but centennial year in America. And what was going on from the big centennial celebration, right? Uh, that was nothing compared to what else was going on. You're going to find out all the historical events. You know, see, he pulls things together that I hadn't really thought about. You know, he, he talks about Custer's Last Stand. He talks about Wild Bill. Hickok being uh, killed up in Deadwood. We have appearances by Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, and Baseball. 
That's right. Baseball makes it in here, too. And one of the most amazing ones is the Northfield bank robbery up in Minnesota. That gets in here, too. Everything that was going on in 1876 that summer and what surrounded it is part of this book. Now, it is an easy to read book. Very simple to read. And you know why I recommend this even more than the fact that it's a great book? It's just talking about history in America that we don't learn. We don't know about it. Your kids don't know about it. Your grandkids don't know about it. We know somewhat about it. But he brings all these things together. And by reading this, we learn what was really going on. We were reading about what happened at Custer's last stand and how delays, how delays really affected the whole thing. Because we'll find out in that when you read this that they were supposed to start in the middle of winter. And instead, they waited till the summer. And by that time, there were 10,000 Indians waiting for 135 cavalrymen. <laughs> Those are not good odds, my friends. <laughs> not good odds at all. Lots of stuff going on. I'm talking about <laughs> the Northfield bank robbery was amazing when the people fought back. You had the Younger and the Jesse James gangs combining, going on. I'm telling you, it, it's a lot happening out there. And then, like I said, the first year of baseball. And we got some interesting things finding that they're in here. because. You know, we find out, and you, I want you to listen to this when you get to uh, the podcast with Chris. Doc Holliday, the photo we all think of Doc Holliday, that's actually not Doc Holliday, it's somebody else, you see. And then we also talk about a guy, you know, Candy Cummings, who's in the Hall of Fame. He's a guy who invented the curveball. He's in the book, too. But wait a minute, when you go to Cooperstown, that's not Candy Cummings' picture. No, they use his, either his brother or his nephew. So there's a lot of things they're finding out here that are wrong or mistaken or whatever, but the whole stories come together in a one beautifully written book by Chris Wimmer, and you're going to really, really like it, and uh, I can't wait for his next one to come out because I, I tell you, get your kids, your grandkids to read this book because then they'll find out what really went on, okay, in that summer of 1876. Now, our final, that's right, our final category is mystery. And we got to the last three. You've had them with me for 10 books. We've got three more to go, friends. Here we go. This mystery. Everybody loves mysteries and thrillers. They are one of the most popular genres out there. So let's begin by ooh, ooh, The Heart of the Nile. That's right. The Heart of the Nile by Will Thomas. Say, Thomas. Yep. That's Julia Bryan. Uh, Thomas's husband, Will. Oh, they're my favorite husband and wife writing team. And I'm going to tell you what. You, you never know what you're going to discover when you're weighing a mummy at the British Museum. That's what this is all about. This poor gentleman is weighing mummies. He's like a very either unpaid or low-paid person who works the night shift, and his job was to weigh mummies. I guess he had a lot of mummies over there. And anyway, he picks up the mummy, and it weighs too much. And he starts cutting it open. What's causing this weight? And he finds this giant ruby buried in the chest of the, of the uh, mummy. Now he doesn't know what to do. So no one's at the museum, just him. And off he goes. He goes out. He goes trying to find the head of the museum to tell him what he's found. And guess what? Yeah, he's killed. Oh, my God. Who killed him? Where is the ruby? What happened? Who is the mummy? You know, I'm weirded out to find what's going on. This is book 14 of the Barker and Llewellyn mystery series. Now, what's going to appeal to me and should appeal to all of you? Will writes an independent Victorian mystery novel. It's not dependent on Sherlock Holmes, okay? How many books have you seen that use Sherlock Holmes, hmm? that try to add on to that, that books, those books that were written by Conan Doyle? Hmm? This is an independent situation, nothing to do with the other ones. He creates a beautiful, beautiful uh, description of Victorian England and what these two Enquiry agents, that's what they are, enquiry agents, Barker and Llewellyn, with all their uh, things they've gone through. Now, I've read around five or six of his books. This is the first one. I got to be honest with you, I started at book 14. You didn't need to have one to 13 to know what was going on, okay? Well written in that regard. And if there was a reference, it was easy to figure out. So this is a great book, and we're here trying to find out who killed this nighttime helper at the museum. What was behind it? Who was behind it? And was this really Cleopatra's mummy? I don't know. We're going to have to find out. I'll tell you what, Will Thomas is <laughs> keeps on the seat of your pants there because it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Great, great mystery. Now, I like to go to 
Ooh, another fine five-star effort here by the Devil's Playground. The Devil's Playground, and this is by Craig Phillips. Now, this is a riveting story that sets in the 1920s a mystery regarding the death of the star movie star Norma Carlton. Now, this is fiction, okay, but it takes so much from history. It is unbelievable. This is a cross-country journey to solve this question as to who killed Norma Carlton and why. It begins in the 1880s. It's in Kansas. It's over in, uh, it's in Oklahoma. It moves to Hollywood. It moves back into the deserts. It goes all the way from the 80s to 1960s, trying to find this question and find out about this one movie, a cursed production of a movie called The Devil's Playground. That's right. That's the name of the title of the movie, a silent movie. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what, Craig Phillips has written many, many wonderful books, award-winning books over in Europe and uh, elsewhere. And this is his first one he sets over here in America. And he's done some amazing research. I mean, we we follow a Hollywood fixer by the name of Mary Rourke, who in herself, you know, that's unusual to have female fixers back in the 20s. And she tries to peel away the mystery. Who did this? And who is Norma Carlton? Who did she have feuds with? And he uses background information, you know, uh, historical information to to flesh out this book, you know. Is filled with Hollywood history and movie facts. And again, as I've said, if you follow me throughout the year, I love Hollywood. I love old movies. I love the silent era. This is this this is right there. You put this mystery together. This is something that's really, really fantastic. And I got to tell you, it spans eighty years. By the end, hmm, who knows? Who knows? So again, this is a great mystery: The Devil's Playground by Craig Phillips. And last but not least, my good friend Nev Marsh. That's right. Nev has written uh, book three. It's called The Spanish Diplomat's Secret. This is book three of her award-winning series starring Captain Jim and Lady Diana. And yes, this is all about these two people, a husband and wife. They're now not a detective team. Jim's a detective. But sometimes I think Lady Diana's a little bit smarter. See, they start out over in India. They're both Indians, but of different classes and castes. Now, that in itself is very interesting because they eventually married back in book one, which is called Murder in Old Bombay. And as she explained to us in that book, that's a murder that's over 100 years old and has yet to be resolved. And so there's, that's how they got together, trying to solve that problem, figure out who killed somebody back then. Now they moved to America. He's got a PI agency up or in, uh, I think, in Boston area. But they're moving to England to see her brother, who's in England. And this is a locked room mystery, okay? It's a locked room mystery set in an enclosed area because it all takes place on a cruise liner in the middle of the ocean. And somebody, a Spanish diplomat, is killed early on. And Captain Jim has given, <laughs> given given the dubious honor of trying to figure out who killed him. And he's got six days or less to figure this out because by that time it will dock and then the British authorities will take over and they don't want that to happen because they're afraid of international incidents. And this is some fun book. I mean, this is all sort of, again, just like I talked about with uh, Devil's uh, Playground, Nev uses historical facts about a lot of this, about what was behind this. And, you know, it builds a wonderful story about this murder and why this person was killed. Just fantastic. And if you like locked room mysteries, this is one for you. Like I said, the locked room mystery set on an enclosed area. You know, you're on a boat. We've got ghosts. We've got sea myths. We've got revenge. we got all sorts of stuff in this book. I mean, this goes on and on. It is a wonderful book, and the book covers of her books are out of this world. Oh, that's what first attracted me to Murder in Old Bombay, and it's no difference now. Here we are with the, uh, the Spanish Diplomat Secret. Beautiful books, beautiful writing. I think she's got a few more in her on this one. I certainly hope so, because this is one of the top top series I found, mystery series out there. Again, it's the Captain Jim and Lady Diana 
Mysteries. This is book three. Again, you don't need one or two. This you read right away. You go right into it. It's called The Spanish Diplomat's Secret by Nev March. Whew, my friends, I have spoken for almost 40 plus minutes and I'm exhausted. I'm dry. I'm parched. But you know what? I wanted to give you my Baker's Dozen Christmas gift list because these are 13 books that I think any one would be a spectacular gift for your husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is, children, grandchildren. These are books you would enjoy. They're readable books. It's been a year of discovery. We've been finding authors that we may not have heard of before. And I'm going to bet you that many of these authors you may not have heard of until I talked about them. They might not be found on Washington you know, Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or whatever list of the top books in, out there. But, you know, there was something in it that piqued my interest. And, you know, I'm glad I could share that with you. So anyway, on behalf of ViewsOnBooks.com, on behalf of Podcast Studio X, this is Blaine DeSantis for Books and Looks, saying may all your leads be pages 